in the realm of space exploration. The solar system is our neighborhood. Since visiting the moon in 69, we've dropped in on almost every body around the sun. In 2015, the New Horizons probe completed the first flyby of our most distant neighbor, Pluto. It took over nine years to get there, but at every step of the way, the unmanned spacecraft was guided remotely from Earth. The way we navigate today when we send these probes out, even the one that went to Pluto, is we have a combination of data taken by the flying spacecraft and our big computers here on the Earth that are processing radio information that comes from those spacecraft. When we went by Pluto, we were basically so accurate that we were hitting a golf ball into a hole from Los Angeles to London. That's how accurate that was done. Sending directions to probes works for solar system exploration. But as we set our sights on the stars, the distances are so enormous, a new question emerges. How to navigate a journey of light years. If we were ever to go explore a planet around another star, the distance would be so great that the machine would have to essentially operate on its own. We call that autonomy. We're taking big steps in that direction. With Curiosity, we did a lot. Landed on Mars in 2012, Curiosity was the first spacecraft equipped with an autonomous navigation system. Given coordinates by mission control, the rover could image its surroundings and compute a safe path across the Martian landscape. But for an interstellar mission, there will be no relaying instructions. All the navigation would have to be on board. All the algorithms, the computations of the orbit, the computations of the maneuvers to get to the right place, what stars to look at is for this year, what stars to look at for next year. What we would have to do is extend our minds to imagine all the possibilities that they might run into. And we would spend literally years building this hierarchy of possibilities into this artificial intelligent machine. It would have to know at all times how well all its critical systems were doing and how to fix them if they weren't working right and how to replace them if they couldn't be fixed. What a challenge. I enter the Minovan star system 49.6 years since my departure. Open my transceiver and prepare to send the message home. I have arrived. With any mission, communication is paramount. Most spacecraft do not return. Instead, they send their data back to Earth. When great distances in the speed of light get involved, it becomes a very, very different sort of experience. Simple words like now take on a kind of a different meaning. I remember when we were landing on Mars, from when you hit the top of the Martian atmosphere to when you're on the surface, it takes about six minutes. At that time, the one, what we call the one-way light time, how long it takes a signal to travel at the speed of light from Mars to Earth was 10 minutes. All systems are go. We are currently six minutes away from hitting the top of the Martian atmosphere. So we're sitting there in the control room, and we're watching the radio signal, and we're watching the spacecraft begins to slow down and curve down in the Martian atmosphere. And it's just at the top of the atmosphere. The reality is, out at Mars, it's been on the surface for four minutes. 
moving at a speed of 173 miles per hour. We are near and it may be a happy, healthy rover, or it may be a smoking hole in the ground, and I don't know. But I'm watching this, and I'm not seeing reality at that moment. And magnify that. So instead of 10 minutes, it's 10 years. Communication with every craft currently in space is conducted via the giant dishes of the deep space network, each powerful enough to track a signal from Pluto no stronger than a CB radio. All of our deep space communications are run through the deep space network. That's an array of very large uh, satellite dishes. Um, they're set up at three locations around the world. Uh, one is in California at uh, Goldstone. Uh, one is in Australia at Canberra, and one is in Spain at Madrid. We need a very large dish area in order to collect all the energy and be able to communicate all the way out at places like Pluto, um, where our spacecraft are going. In 2014, Matthew Abramson was mission manager of a radical new form of communication installed on the International Space Station, designed to overcome the limitation of traditional radio transmission. The limitation is primarily the, the distance that we're sending the transmission over. When we send out that signal, uh, it spreads out over time and, and over space. And so uh, as that spreads out, it dilutes the signal power. And the further out you go, the, the lower and lower your data rate is, or it gets out to the level of something like your uh, dial-up modems that we used to have many years ago. When the New Horizons probe sent back pictures from Pluto via radio transmission, the signal was so weak, it took 15 months to downlink the images from a 12-hour flyby. But with the technology Abramson launched and tested in 2014, that download time could be reduced to just one day by sending data back to Earth on beams of light. The idea is you take a focused laser beam and send the signal, same signal over that beam, but it's much more efficient because you have this focused signal that's not spreading out as much over time. Laser wavelengths are packed much more densely than sound waves so they transmit more information per second and with a stronger signal. The greater bandwidth allows spacecraft to downlink multiple large packets of data simultaneously and in record time. The reason for that is this, we go out further out into the universe and we go to places like Mars and Jupiter. Currently today, we're just getting back single images of the science. And in the future, if you do have a high bandwidth system, like an optical system, you could get back high definition video. And I think getting high definition video back would be a game changer for space exploration. I fly by the gas giant exoplanet Minerva C. I use its atmosphere to create drag and pull me in towards my target. I trace an elliptical trajectory around the Minervan sun and emerge to take my first glimpse of my new home. couple from my antenna. My explorer module holds my mind. I commence entry, landing, and descent sequence. Enter orbit. 
so close now. I deploy my satellites to map the surface. And scout potential landing sites. Is this new world ready to be known? correctly exploration at its finest have been programmed into an extension of our species it belongs to no single individual it is more than anything else a symbol of humanity working together to create something whose only purpose is to gather knowledge what a beautiful thought And after a long period of time, finally the moment of truth is coming. And more than likely, the people that designed it originally are no longer alive. Welcome to the Ops Lab, Francesca. Mm -hmm. And they have passed on this thrill, this passion, to their children and perhaps even to their grandchildren. Okay. We're gonna walk around on Mars, Francesca. This one's cool over here. Uh-huh. Will it be that they found life? Will it be that they found a planet where we could someday exist? Whatever it is, it will be a historical milestone unlike any other. That moment when something new is revealed that no one's ever seen before, that's just glorious. That's exploration. And it's going to happen when we go to other worlds around other stars in a very, very, very big way. We'll be sitting back on Earth, and that downlink will come, and the video or the pictures or the spectra or whatever it is are going to come up on a screen, and everybody's jaws are just going to drop.